Good news and some bad news. We're doing a really clever experiment with the sermon. We're going to have it recorded and put up on the screen, and that's going to be brilliant. The bad news is bec- we're doing this because Matt has got COVID. And um, so the communion service we were going to have, we can't, I'm afraid. So we're going to do something like a normal morning service, um, assuming that the slides uh, behave themselves. It's going to be um, a brilliant time to worship God. And uh, we will welcome everyone, as I already have, if you're a guest, if you're a visitor, if you've come to see Matt, (laughs) as his parents have. Um, Hard luck. (laughs) You got me instead. Um, welcome to the, those watching on online, on the videos and all that sort of stuff. Let's have a wave to them. Thank you very much. And a greeting. The Lord be with you. Even though this is the prayer of preparation for the communion service, it's brilliant to just set our minds on God whenever we worship. So let's say it together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We come together because our God is great. So let's encourage one another with a song that states that big and bold. The splendor of the king. Um, Yes, just let's encourage one another. Stand if you're able.
The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's what Hebrews teaches us. So let us confess what God already knows about us in the words beginning Almighty God, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for the fifth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, send down upon your church the riches of your spirit and kindle in all who minister the gospel your countless gifts of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I was going to say, at this point, I'll introduce our vicar, Matt. Not so. But we are going to sing a song that we sang, well, we first met it, I think, as a video during those cold, dark days of COVID confinement. Since then, we've done it not long ago, but if you stub your toe when you get out of bed, you might want to sing this song and remember that God is always with you. So please stand and sing. If you stub your toe when you get out of bed And you sip in the shower and you knock your head If you miss your cranky and your bite ties flat If you go easy and you step on the grass Remember the Lord, oh, oh, oh Remember that He is in control Remember the Lord Bed and you don't know what, and you can't. 
So uh, the children and young people will be going over to their groups in a moment, but first we're going to say a prayer for them and for the leaders. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will send your Holy Spirit into the hearts and minds of all of us, that the young people will have fun and will learn about your goodness to us, and that the leaders will communicate clearly and will have fun themselves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So please, those who are leaving, do so. Excellent. Have fun. And we'll see you later. Meantime, June is coming to read the next passage from Ephesians. The readings on page the readings on page 1111 1111 in the church bible the reading is taken from ephesians 6 verses 1 to 9 page 1111 children obey your parents in the lord for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of the heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people because you know that the Lord will reward each of you for whatever good that they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, June. I think we now come to the great experiment. Daniel is going to run uh, the video that Matt has hastily recorded of the sermon this morning. Let's see if this works. Well, good morning, everyone. Really sorry not to be with you. I'm going to pray for us as we uh, think about this next little bit of Ephesians. So, Father God, uh, as we think about your word and these practical instructions from Paul about walking wisely as your children, we ask that you'd help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I can still remember the first time that I went into Aldi, I think it was, uh, during the first COVID lockdown. And I put my pound in the trolley and uh, sanitised my hands and the trolley handle, uh, waited for someone to come out of the shop so that I was allowed in, and then tried to keep my distance from the person with the trolley in front of me. And in fact, I was trying so hard that I missed the bagels uh, on the shelf. And I was too scared to, to go back in case I got too close to the person behind me and we all got really used didn't we to, to moving around to walking to, to pushing our trolleys in ways that were designed to to save lives and um 
Well, it wasn't only with the trolley, was it? We did it on the doorstep. If somebody came to the door, they'd step back, you'd step back. We did it on the pavement. We'd step into the road uh, to give people space or out on the country lanes as we all got out for our one bit of exercise a day. We were walking, stepping out of each other's way in such a way to try and save lives. And I think that's a really helpful way for us to think about these practical chapters in Ephesians that we've been looking at, chapters four to six. We're thinking about, this is our first slide, walking wisely, walking wisely in a way that saves lives. And as we keep saying in the section, we're not talking about living a certain way so that we are saved. We're saved by grace, not by what we do. But we're thinking about being who we are. We're thinking about walking in the light because we're children of the light. And the thing is, as we do that, as we live distinct, transformed lives, as we walk in the light, we get to remind each other of the gospel. And so when we as a church family walk in a manner worthy of the calling we've received in, in unity and love, well, that displays the gospel and we get to see it. And last week we thought about that with marriages. So when a husband and a wife walk in a manner worthy of the calling they've received, they get to display something of the gospel. Because, of course, it's the example of Jesus uh, that uh, we are following. Husbands, as you serve and lead and lay down your lives because of how precious your wife is, it's a picture of the preciousness of the church for whom Jesus made the greatest sacrifice, the most staggering, stunning sacrifice, as he gave up his life and shed his blood and uh, gave up his life for his precious bride. So you can start to see, I think, how thinking about how we walk, how we live, being careful about how we behave is actually really exciting. Uh, and you may not have felt that way um, last week or the week before as we thought about these practical chapters. Maybe just when Ephesians was read, maybe you were thinking, well, uh, last week you were thinking I'm not married. Today you're thinking I'm not a child. I'm not a parent. I'm not a slave or a master uh, or even a worker or a boss. But I think if we understand these verses right, there's much, much more here than, say, just a reminder of something you could pray for a parent or pray for a child if that's not you. Because these verses don't just explain how some people should behave and the rest of us just have to wait until there's a bit that's more relevant for us. No, they help all of us to see what the gospel looks like in practice. And even when just some of us do that, the rest of us get a great reminder of the gospel, which we need, don't we? We all need that in a world that constantly denies Jesus. I don't know if you've noticed, but pretty much everything Paul has written in his letter to the Ephesian church so far uh, is really positive. Um, the impression we get is they're doing really well. There's no big rebuke. Uh, they've not made any big false uh, errors, uh, believed wrong things. But within a generation, maybe 20 or 30 years further on, when John was writing his book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, he says, uh, he, he, John records Jesus saying these words to the church in Ephesus. He says they have forsaken their first love. See, the church in Ephesus got distracted. Their hearts grew a bit colder. They were less passionate about walking in the light. They were less careful how they were living and they were more foolish, perhaps. And so Paul, right back here, 10, 20, 30 years earlier, as he writes this letter, he knew what he was doing. He knows that we get easily distracted. He knows that our hearts wander off because we lose our first love. And so we all need to hear these verses. Some of us, yes, will um, uh, it will be more applicable to us and it will help us to know how to live. But the rest of us need them too, so that we get to see behaviour around us of people walking transformed lives, walking in a way that saves lives as we get reminded of the gospel. And so again, when our church walks wisely, using gifts in love and unity, well, it's going to remind us of the gospel. When we notice a change in someone who's not living how they used to, they're more distinct from the world now. They're walking wisely and living a godly life. We know it's only because of Jesus. Well, last week we moved from the church to the home and this week we stay in the home to begin with and then we go off to work. So here's uh, our first uh, little heading uh, this morning, walking wisely at home. This is verses one to four. So like last week, we had wives and then husbands. Paul starts with with the body part, if you like, of the head body relationship. And so he talks to children first before parents and he says to them, 
pretty simple command, obey. And uh, it's worth noticing, isn't it, this is stronger than the word to wives last week. Submission from the wife to the husband was to be freely, willingly given to a husband who's being like Jesus. A wife's submission to husband is meant to be a loving response to love as the husband loves her. Uh, but children obey is stronger, isn't it? Some of you um, children here this morning, you're in secondary school. Uh, perhaps you've got your own house key, you've got your own mobile phone. Perhaps you get yourself to school and from school. Maybe you think, I'm pretty grown up now. You can't tell me what to do, mum or dad. But look at, um, just look up to verse 31 of chapter 5. Uh, Paul says this for, he's quoting Genesis, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. The assumption there, do you see, they will, uh, a man will leave his father and mother. The, the assumption in the Bible is that independence comes when you leave home. And um, I guess that probably happened a bit younger in Paul's day. Uh, but I guess for us, that's kind of 18, isn't it? 18 to 20. Not that you stop being a child of your parents, but you sort of uh, cease to be a child under their responsibility. You start to stand on your own two feet uh, and you um, uh, take decisions and responsibility for the direction of your life. And first, Paul argues uh, for this, children, that we, you should obey your parents just because it's right. It's there in verse one, isn't it? Obey your parents for this is right. And he does give that really important caveat in the Lord. So here's the point, I think, unless your parents tell you to do something that's prohibited or illegal, obey them. It's quite simple, really. That's what parents uh, are there for. And so children, you are to obey them. Don't do something if they've asked you not to do it. Don't do something even if everyone else is doing it. Don't watch something even if it's not on your phone, it's on a friend's phone. If you know your parents have asked you not to. And this is from the next little section about work, but I, I think it applies. Obey your parents when they're watching and when they're not watching. And it's just right. It's the right thing to do. It's the way the world is set up. But it's also the right thing to do because God commands it, isn't he? That's, that gets picked up um, in verse 2. Honour your father and mother. This is the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Children, the wise way to walk, if you want to honour God, is to honour your parents. And so here's an example for us of how children walking wisely at home can save us as they remind us of the gospel. The Christian teenagers who, who, who all their friends are saying, why should I listen uh, to, to, to you, to their parents? They're thinking about their own honour, which we know is the heart of sin, isn't it? It's all about me. I put me first. I don't want God or anyone else to tell me what to do. So what a great opportunity you children have when you walk wisely to obey your parents and to do it because it's right, to do it because that's the best way. Uh, it will go well with you. It will go better if you do that. But how about this reason on top of all that? Obey your parents because it reminds the rest of us of the power of the gospel to transform selfish, sinful hearts from darkness to life, to light and from death to life. And we need that reminder. We need you to obey your parents because we need that gospel reminder. But then Paul moves on, doesn't he, to parents, verse four, and specifically fathers. Do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, this doesn't mean mums don't teach the gospel. Um, if you're in a, a home where there's no uh, Christian father, um, uh, obviously, we're going to uh, mums are going to teach the gospel to their children. But where there is a gospel speaking, gospel believing father in the home, it's your responsibility. That's what Paul is saying. And again, here's a little picture of how good God's plan is when Jesus is head over everything. Godly Christian dads, you get to show us that when you lead your children well and teach them the gospel, what a privilege that is for your children, but also for the rest of us to see you doing that. And I guess this also might be surprising for us because the world says lots to us, doesn't it? All sorts of things about what it is to be a real man. But here's Paul's definition. He says, take your child, dad, sit down, because to read the Bible at tea time or to read the Bible at bedtime with your toddler or your teenager, that is your responsibility and privilege. 
as a transformed uh, follower of Jesus. But thirdly, isn't it surprising as well how simple it is? There's no 20 steps, 40 ways to parent your child, 100 top tips for Christian parenting. He just says, verse 4, don't exasperate. Don't exasperate. Do explain and instruct, but don't exasperate. And aren't they a great pair? Great in that kind of painful way that there's no wiggle room at all. You can't teach them the gospel and then be grotty. You've got to teach them and live it out. Don't exasperate and explain. And so I take it for all of us dads, many times, day after day, as we explain and teach and instruct the gospel, we're also going to need to say sorry to our kids and ask them to forgive us for the ways that we fail. And what a great way for your kids to see the gospel and for all of us to watch the gospel lived out in front of us as the gospel transforms Christian dads from absent, distant, distracted, selfish to present, participating, serving, loving, caring, gentle dads who teach their kids about Jesus. And of course, this isn't a perfect promise. It's not a picture of a of a Christian making factory that if you put a child in and you add a Christian dad or mum who explains the gospel, you turn the handle and out they come, out comes a Christian. No, we know, don't we? Chapter two, we're saved by grace. So we've got to pray. Do pray uh, for your kids as you instruct them and as you don't exasperate them. But it reminds us, doesn't it? The biggest need for the children in our church the biggest need is not for them to be getting consistently good grades, not for them to be excellent at music or excellent at sport. Uh, it doesn't matter if they can't spell contentious, which I can't spell, uh, or whatever you think it takes for your child to succeed. What they really need is to know Jesus. And as Paul reminds us what they need most, it reminds us what we need most. We are not saved by being perfect parents with perfect kids. And if the only thing that verse four makes you think of is how badly wrong you got all of this about half an hour before church started. Well, Ephesians is great, isn't it? Keep reading. Keep reading chapter two and verse four of God's great love and mercy and forgiveness. We will teach our children so much about the gospel when we show that we need to keep clinging to forgiveness. Walk wisely at home. Um, so then finally, walk wisely at work and this is the last little head and body pairing that um, Paul gives us in verses five to nine and I guess as we read these verses um, about slaves slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart our minds might easily jump to horrific um, racist based slavery that still sometimes makes our headlines doesn't it but slavery in Paul's time I think it's fair to say wasn't exactly parallel to that not necessarily racially driven and slaves had opportunities to, to free themselves. Uh, some of those who were slaves held positions like being the teacher of the household or doctors uh, and lots of other jobs as well. So Paul is not making a pro-slavery argument here. This is not about the ethics of slavery. Rather, this is about transformed, careful, walking in the light in whatever situation you find yourself. And here we are thinking about the work context. If you've got a boss or if you are a boss. And in fact, just like last week, Paul here is actually tipping the cultural norms upside down. So last week by saying husbands love your wife as yourself, that was outrageous in Paul's day. Here again he's recognising the equal value of both sides of the, uh, of the worker boss relationship. So what does it look like to work, walk wisely at work? Well Paul is not saying the boss somehow becomes God, but we are to imagine that the things they ask her to, to do are are Jesus asking them to do it so that when we obey and, and we we do the work that's our responsibility we're doing so as if Christ asks us to do it so we do them well we do them to the best of our ability we do them when the boss is in sight and in the office or on site and when they're not and we work well and we work hard and we do that even when it's nowhere near our review date or the potential for promotion and so here's an interesting thought, isn't it? If your boss or line manager or employer saw everything you did, if you're working from home more these days, if your boss saw everything you did, all of your time, how you use every moment, would they get a better view of you or a worse view of you? Would they be pleasantly surprised or would they be disappointed? Remember chapter 5 verse 16, make the most of every opportunity. Well that's the body part, isn't it? And the head part uh, to the boss, the Christian uh, boss. 
uh, you have a head over you. If you've got anybody working for you, if you're in charge of others, treat them as Jesus treats you. Remember that you are answerable to Jesus. And so be gentle. Uh, and no favouritism, no distinction, no partiality. Uh, because in Jesus' sight, there's no um, superiority. Jesus is less concerned, isn't he? Whether you're a chief executive or the chief cleaner. Whether you're slave or free, top boss or bottom rung of the ladder. Have you been changed by the gospel? Is the question. Are you walking in the light? That's the big point, isn't it? How does God's big plan to have everything under Jesus, how is that impacting us? God's big plan to have Jesus over everything, how is that impacting you at home when the front door's closed? How is it impacting you at work? And when you're in any of those situations and you perhaps remember something that we've talked about on these Sunday mornings or someone reminds you, aren't you a Christian? Should you be saying that? Should you be living like that? Well, what a great reminder to us that we should be walking carefully, walking wisely. And we thought, didn't we, how, how living like that, living in the light, walking in the light, exposes the darkness. Uh, and that's one side of it. But today, here's the big challenge and, and, and opportunity for us. We get to remind each other of the gospel. And so we're not walking like this to try and save our lives. But we are walking like this because as others see us, as others watch us walking wisely, well, it reminds them of the gospel, the gospel that can save them and save them for all eternity. And let me pray for us. Our Father God, we want to be those who are careful, not foolish. We want to be those who are wise in the way that we walk. We want to walk in the light because Jesus has brought us into the light and made us alive. And so we pray that you would help us, help us encourage each other and help us demonstrate the gospel to each other in our parenting, in the way that we go about every part of our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we uh, are going to, ex well, tell each other what our faith is by saying together the Nicene Creed. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now Rose is going to lead us in our prayers. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us here today and for the great privilege of being able to bring our requests to you. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us your power to live for you. Help us to continue to yield our wills to you and to put, to put each other's needs ahead of our own. As parents, help us not to exasperate our children and may our children recognize that we have their best interests at heart 
and want to respect and obey their parents and those who care for them. We pray for families where relationships have broken down and children aren't confident that they are loved or parents are at the end of their tether with the behavior of their children. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We thank you for all the events that are happening this week in the life of our church. Thank you for the mission breakfast yesterday. We pray for Alex and Susanna, Bella, Elias and Rosanna as they enjoy the time in the UK. Let them have good times of fun and fellowship with friends and family, as well as sharing about their work in Senegal. We pray for the cafe service tonight, that a good number of people will come and want to learn about your big plan. We pray for next Saturday, when we will be welcoming people to the musical evening. Thank you for this opportunity to tell people more about you. Please be with the musicians as they share their talent with us and tell us about their faith. And as we gather on Saturday morning to work on the gardens and the halls, help us to make the church building look more welcoming for our guests, as well as having fun and fellowship while we do it. We also pray for the PCC and all the discussions and decisions that will take place. Give us wisdom regarding Prenton Library and any involvement we might have in its future. Please guide and help us. Lord, hear us. Lord. As we think of our local neighbourhood, Lord, we pray for the local schools, particularly Prenton Primary and Devonshire Park Primary Schools. We pray for the children and staff as they break up for the summer, for a good time of refreshment for everyone. We, pray, we pray especially for children leaving school, either to move to high school or leaving for good, and for families where the holidays bring additional stress, be it emotional or financial or both. We also pray for the local hospices, St. John's and Clare House, and for the work they do with people at the end of life. Thank you for the compassion and care they give, and please bless their work. And we pray for those who live in Mendip Close, Melrose Gardens, and Mellor Road. Lord, hear us. Thinking about the wider world, Father, we pray for the deliberations of the Conservative Party as they choose a new leader who will also be our Prime Minister. Grant wisdom to all concerned and let us have leaders of integrity and honesty who prize justice and righteousness above mere popularity. We pray for the troubled areas of the world, continuing to pray for Ukraine, Mozambique, Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. Lord, hear us. Finally, Lord, we pray for those who are suffering, including Linda Cottier, Mark Hughes, Jake Berry, Karen Robinson, Mick, Fiona Poynton, Barry Harding, Ted Harrison, Janet Jones, Jean Keeley, James McCulloch, Rich Richard Martin, and we pray especially for Matt and Henry, who are both of whom are not well, and all those mourning the deaths of Eddie Green, James Hughes, Olive Wright and Joyce Turner. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we conclude our prayers with the, Lord, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Are you inspired to give your life afresh to Jesus. We're going to sing, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. Please stand if you're able.
Please be seated and let's see what the notices are. This evening, this evening, we have uh, another session in Cafe Church. Uh, we will have Alex, our partner, or one of our partner missionaries from Senegal here uh, sharing with us. And um, I think we're going to be flying by the seat of our pants on that one as well because the vicar's not here, or not well. Um, what next? Saturday, Rosie's already prayed. I hope you're praying for friends and people that you can invite to our musical evening. Uh, there are tickets and flyers uh, available. Flyers, flyers, not tickets. Um, and um, there'll be wine and canapes and wine and canapes isn't that flash and it's free oh yeah that's good so um that's next saturday seven o'clock um if you can help are we still looking for helpers we're looking for helpers see paula who isn't here oh she is oh yes she is she She's not sitting with her husband. <laughs> uh, next is um, stay for coffee or tea or whatever and a bit of a chat after this service. And we go to our final hymn. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices. Let's stand if we're able and sing with our voices to the front wall as loud as possible. So, as our service comes to a close, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In, in the, the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Please do stay for coffee.